Welcome to the Narrating Cold Wars Conference. Uh, my name is Noit Banai, and I'm Associate Professor of Art and Theory in the Academy of Visual Arts at Hong Kong Baptist University. And I'm happy to greet you again, if you've been joining us throughout the day or for the first time, if you're just joining us now. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Caroline A. Jones, who is Professor of Art History at MIT, where she also serves as Associate Dean in the School of Architecture and Planning. She studies modern and contemporary art with a particular focus on its technological modes of production, distribution and reception, and on its interfaces with science. Her solo, co uh, her solo authored publications include Machine in the Studio, Eyesight Alone, and The Global Work of Art, which is a must read. And she's also been editor of Picturing Science, Producing Art, Sensorium, and Experience. She's also a curator um, who has uh, curated numerous shows at MIT, uh, including uh, the Hans Hacke exhibition, and uh, the groundbreaking show, Sensorium. Um, I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce her. I'm very, very happy to have her join us today. And uh, she will be giving a keynote lecture titled Sadeka Nakvi, a Pakistani Picasso for the Cold War. Thank you very much, Professor Jones. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I wanna thank Kenneth Tan and Noit Banai for including me in this extraordinarily rich conference. It's 5 a.m. here on the East Coast of the United States, and uh, but I'm really excited to be here virtually with you and how lucky that a global pandemic trained us in how to be together without being physically together. Um, so I will begin by sharing my screen. Looks like we've lost Caroline. Caroline, I think you uh, you you're frozen. Can you hear us? What did she do? Well, hopefully she will be she will reconnect soon. I'm sure this is just a momentary glitch. Um, please bear with us while we sort out uh, while we sort this out. part of the Zoom experience. There she is. Okay, good. Ah, good. We just need to unmute you, Caroline, uh, Professor Jones. Yeah, it just seems like everything dropped here. Let's try this again. I'm already on the second slide, so. Is everybody seeing that okay? Okay. Let's hope the inter internet is, uh, is with us. May the force be with us here. So in this book, I argued that fairs and biennials were politics by other means, engaging a global theater of display to produce hybrid characters such as the Brazilian Rodin, the Dutch Mie, and the subject of my keynote here tonight, the Pakistani Picasso. As I will discuss today, I term this adjectival emplacement predicated internationalism, allowing us to explore how such a simple linguistic maneuver can enforce centers and peripheries that are willingly taken up by local agents in order to engage the conversation that power propels. The global is an enduring preoccupation as my book cover showing a Renaissance celestial orb hoisted at the Parisian 2006 Jour de Patrimoine suggests. But for today, I wanna to clarify a little Cold War perspective on the global. We need to situate the early decades of the Cold War 
the setting for my narrative, in a fundamentally 20th century aerial imaginary. This is by World War II already very well established. It enters with the first aerial photographs made by the 19th century balloonists and even from small cameras attached to the legs of trained pigeons. That's a 19th century trick. The aerial as a surveillance mode becomes beautifully codified in the exceptional cartography of Richard Eddy's Harrison, who already imagines the emerging Cold War in 1944 for the US Army Information Agency as a covetous view by the USSR looking over Eastern Europe. This almost satellite gaze seems to anticipate the 1957 Sputnik or the Telstar vantage point, but it is not yet the whole earth composited by the Western Telstar or later whole earth scan. So here we're seeing the first scan of the whole earth from the Dodge satellites. And that acronym stands for the US Department of Defense Gravitational Experiment, put into geostationary orbit in June 1967. Such an aerial surveillance globality was codified in multiple sites, not least the Museum of Modern Art in New York, who mounted the explicitly aerial Airways to Peace in the summer of 1943. For the thinkers at this symposium, such, such exhibitions with their enveloping navigable globes pick up from the 19th century World's Fair in becoming subject-making uh, subject machines attempting to produce a global proto-Cold War citizenry from the actually provincial population of the U.S. metropole, New York City. More specifically, for the art historians here, it is significant that once the United States finally joined the Allies and entered the deep throes of World War II, the possibility of a new globalism in art became imaginable for the formerly isolationist USA. And for its isolated modernists in New York, one we can discern here is um, Adolf Gottlieb. I'm having a little trouble getting my slot. There we go. Adolf Gottlieb uh, with his painting um, on the subject of Persephone, which we'll talk about in a moment. Notably, these guys making what the reviewer calls puzzling new art were not yet enlisted in the Cold War politics to come. As is well known to this audience, those soft diplomatic operations would take up Gottlieb and others in the New York School group to signify democratic freedom in shipments of art sent around the world 15 years later, whether that be for State Department exhibitions, whether requested by West Germans for documenta or positioned by Midwestern museum types who were organizing showings of US art for the Venice Biennale. As I've argued elsewhere, these are not top-down cultural engineering moves by an executive branch of the US government so much as they are a diffuse politics of alignment and voluntary hegemony propelled by educated elites and capitalist industrialists. So the artist's letter to the editor following that Times article has come to function as a certain sort of manifesto for a national style what would later be canonized as abstract expressionism. Their position at this early stage was notably nativist and primitivist at its origin, squaring the circle of a dimly perceived West European cosmopolitanism by taking up Parisian surrealist styles and announcing a quote, spiritual kinship with primitive and archaic art. In looking briefly at Gottlieb's paintings of Persephone, we can see this proposed positioning in action as Gottlieb adopts loosely surrealist totemisms to smooth over the extraordinary differences between something like Greek mythology and a supposedly authentic US repertoire appropriating Native American forms. So Persephone, goddess of the underworld, nature, renewal, could be taken by a cosmopolitan Jewish artist such as Gottlieb to be a universalist global signifier for the West's shared archaic past. But visually, she is articulated with a syncretic indigenous form vocabulary mingling West Coast trinket masks 
Northwest Sioux deer hide paintings, Southwest Navajo mandalas, and Great Plains bison rituals. So we're definitely in syncretic territory here. The emerging Cold War globality is thus motley and local. It is everywhere both situated and distinct. The universal always takes its clues from local po politics and problems. And there are specific historical moments that need to be understood when particular positions in Cold War bloc politics become thinkable or hegemonic. Thus, as seen from the very early Cold War perspective in the US in its relation to a country with a vexed US history like Japan, we recall the very different cultural Cold Wars that can be discerned decade to decade. From the militarized propaganda of warfare to the reparative exchanges with the former enemy of the 50s. Obviously, the early 40s are very different from 1952, when a visit from Isamu Noguchi brought some black and white photographs of Franz Klein paintings to the calligraphy magazine Bokobi in Japan, forging a mutual legitimation strategy around meaningless radical calligraphy. If we stay for a moment with this cross-Pacific endorsement of a certain radical avant-garde uh, in Japan and in the US, the 1960s ushered in yet a different moment in the cultural Cold War. So there's a simultaneous reach for calligraphic modernisms, and I'm, I'm using Iftikhar Dadi's very productive phrase here, in the work of Yoshihara Jiro. Well aware of Jackson Pollock, Yoshihara's circle works nonetheless make a sharp delineation of a specifically Zen iconography uh, that evokes Buddhist conceptions of eternal return, images that are semiotically icon, index, and symbol all at once. While tactically engaging the possibly orientalizing moves of Western calligraphic gesture painting, the sophisticated practice and thinking of Yoshihara strategically positions the Gutai group that he founded as deeply alternative to the other gestural modes, materialist and openly performative in spirit. Uh, in other words, his practice is, is quite different from someone like Klein. And this is a very public part of his declarations in the Gutai Manifesto. The 1960s cultural networks in which Yoshihara operated are cautiously translational and transnationalist while continuing to assert notably Japanese themes. Perhaps then, a brilliant strategist such as Yoshihara can prepare us for the 1960s complexities of a calligraphic modernism coming from another quadrant of the globe altogether, namely the tumultuous troisième mode Monde of the South Asian Indian subcontinent, yielding the new nation of Pakistan and the painter, poet, calligrapher, Sadikain. It is here that my esteemed interlocutor, Iftikhar Dadi, names and celebrates a calligraphic modernism among, among various South Asian, specifically Muslim, uh, co cosmopolitan artists. Yet Dadi generates this term from that Islamic perspective, celebrating Sadiqain's poetry and printed books primarily without delving into the paintings of Sadiqain. Notably, Sadiqain's predication, his, um, his, his auction market name, the Pakistani Picasso, relies on paintings and largely ignores uh, this poetry and printed material. This very dichotomy must be understood within the traditional and translational parameters of the cultural Cold War. So let's see. Part two, the Pakistani Picasso. I want to open this section with the best of my archival findings about Sadi Kain, that his first inscription as the Pakistani Picasso was not owing to the off-sided Le Monde daily newspaper in Paris, but to a petanist and nationalist monthly called Le Monde et la Vie, specifically this issue from April, 1964. I will back up to tell this story from one of the, its beginnings, Sadekane's move from Karachi to Paris in 1962, 
But first, I want to assert the surprising nuances of the thesis that emerges from the archives of predicated internationalism. While one might assume that the Pakistani Picasso was produced and enforced solely in the top-down violence of a first world hegemony, the case of Sayed Sadiqin Ahmed Nahvi is usefully complicated in its details. This allows me to propose an explicit thesis for this talk. Artistic agency and acts of viewer appropriation in both center and periphery have roles to play in the predication dynamic, sometimes changing how hegemony operates. Thus, while the first moment of Sadekane's appearance into the European press calls up the association with Picasso explicitly, it is elites and diasporal agents from Pakistani Republic who continue to situate Sadekane, an Urdu speaking artist from a lineage of calligraphers within the ambit of a Picasso already canonized as a marketable cosmopolitan artist. But from both sides of the exchange, writers on Sadekane also seek to put more and different histories within our reach, searching for the difference that Pakistani might uh, secure um, initially in French. While the predication of Sadekane as somehow Picassoid is nearly constant throughout the available literature and will enter my own formal analysis here, I need to clarify the exclusion that predication still portends. The Pakistani Picasso will most certainly not be inserted into Anglophone art histories of post-war modernism until the scholarship of Iftikhar Dadi, Bazira Samindar, and Gemma Sharp explicitly attempt to do so. It will take time for art history to catch up, and this conference is an important contributor to that endless remaking of history. So as with the Picasso Manquet syndrome that Partha Mitter identified in his 2007 discussion of Indian modernist Tagore, or the routine maintenance of colonial modernism as theorized in 2003 by Simone Gikandi in, in regard to Guianese modernist Aubrey Williams, both Tagore and Williams being forcefully and somehow violently compared and made subservient to Picasso, the artist identified as peripheral will always be seen as imitating a European style, not creatively adapting it or heaven for fend anticipating it. These productions of belatedness are well known to any scholar of global modernisms. Picasso is understood to have appropriated primitive, e.g. African art, but neither Africa's Williams nor India's Tagore, it will be allowed to be themselves appropriating Picasso as their own primitive. If the supposed imitator originates from a culture that privileges citation and homage over Euro originality, hierarchies are even more viciously imposed by the Western press. So when Mahmoud Fida Hussein is characterized as the Indian Picasso, for example, he's cut down to size, becoming merely one of many contenders for attention in a still centralized Euro-dominated art history, rather than a titanic figure in his own nation's extensive art world. The case of Hussein historically anticipates the case of Sadkane revealing certain revisionist trajectories within the always restless discipline of art history. If Partha Mitter excoriates historicizations of Tagore and Hussein under the picasso Manke syndrome, younger art historians such as Gemma Sharp can insist on Hussein or Sadekane functioning as post-Cubist, which is also a phrase that Iftikhar Dadi um, originates. Is this formalist locution any better than our other forms of predication? Or does it reveal yet other forms of complex you know, belittlement? Is post-Cubist even available as a concept for Hussein in 1951? Obviously not. Such claims need to find actual historical correlates in their own time, particularly in regard to complex international modernists such as Sada Kane. So, our central case study. Born in 1930, or maybe it was 1931, 
in Am Amroha, in India's northwest province of Uttar Pradesh, under the strongest moments of British colonial rule, Sayed Sadiqan Ahmed Nakhvi became by the 1960s a prominent representative of a nation that didn't exist when he was born, Pakistan. The most celebrated artist in Pakistan by the time of his death in 1987, Sadiqan has a literature that has witnessed a burst of scholarship in the last decade from diasporal South Asians, such as Dadi, writing in English, as well as Islamicists, such as Finbar Barry Flood, who sees Picassisma itself as a turn to Islamic or Moorish commitments to abstraction. We might characterize the two revisionist readings as a Sadiqane for purely South Asian, South Asian Muslim variants on global modernism, that would be Dadi, or a Sadiqane setting the standard for international modernist abstraction in an always already Islamic vein, that would be Flood's position. My own approach is differently historiographic. I wanna ask, how did the Pakistani Picasso come to be constructed as such? And how does it illuminate the operations of a Euro-dominated discourse of modernism as established during the Cold War. This Cold War narrative begins in the international phase of Sadiqane's career when he was asked to send works for showing in the 1961 second Paris Biennale, explicitly to represent his new nation. Following this event, we can say definitively that Sadiqane was indeed constructed within the Western press as comparable and because peripherally comparable, subsidiary to the naturalized Frenchman from Barcelona, Pablo Picasso. But I think my provocation is here. It may turn out that the agents converting mere comparison to predication are actually Pakistani rather than French. Diaspora arch archivists, organic intellectuals, and cultural representatives of the New Republic all came to play a role in Sadiqane's inscription into history. Sadiqane emerges as an appropriately complex case study of 20th century predicated internationalism. He was allowed to represent Pakistan's modernity by the French, but only in order to anneal that modernity to the waning centrality of Francophone culture in a hardening Cold War. Historically, the association to Picasso emerged following Sadiqane's appearance in this Deuxième Biennale de Paris in 1961, where the artist was awarded a laureate by, quote, an international jury of critics, unquote, adjudicating winners in various national categories, the winning entry being his 1960 canvas you're, you're looking at here on the lower left, Le Dernier Super, The Last Supper. The French commissioner, Raymond Cognac, wrote in early October to the press attaché for the Pakistani embassy who had curated Pakistan's contribution, that would be Sayed Waliullah, explaining that the award included a bourse amounting to 800 new French francs per month for an effective stay of five months in France. Sadiqane had actually already visited Paris once before in January 1961 at the invitation of the French Committee of the International Association of Plastic Arts and was somehow slow in taking up this new award, uh, which he found out about through Waliula. So the archives show how the French bureaucrats and the Pakistani embassy negotiated to bring Sadiqane to Paris. None of them doubt that he will want to come. The French complained to each other that, quote, Pakistan has remained very passive, unquote, despite the fact that Sadiqane's prize has attracted positive attention to this new nation. Sayed Waliullah, about whom I'll have more to say in a moment, works hard to get Sadiqane to leave Karachi again and come to Paris for this longer duration. Uh, Documents record that when the young artist finally comes in person to register with the Paris Foreign Affairs Office, it is in early February of 1961, and he's then approximately 30 years old. From what we can now discern during these Paris years, Sadiqane continued on the trajectory of semi-abstraction that had been endorsed by the biennial jury with its award for The Last Supper. Reproductions that survive in the biennial archives from the immediate 
immediate gathering point of 1961 and 62, together uh, with this smaller work here in the lower right, show friezes or clusters of spiky vertical forms, interpretable given the title as knees, feet, rib cages, heads, and even a halo in the center where a potentially Christ figure might be discernible. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm talking about this area right here in the middle of this frieze of figures. Uh, this Christ figure, interestingly, has the geometric form of a crescent upended over a diamond-shaped head, heightened by a luminous white surround. The 1962 study associated with the Last Supper work is more chaotic, suggesting the milling crowds of the Passion. The work Trio from that same year, which is still in the collection of Sayed Waliullah's family and visible in photographs of Waliullah in his Paris study during the 60s, is similarly dark and brooding and even more abstract. As such, it is, it is less declaratively Christological, for I would propose not every trio is a trinity. But clearly, these works alluding to a prophet in monotheism could read in Catholic France significant to the translational Cold War context that Sadikain is anticipating by painting these works and titling them this way in the first place. Sadikain immediately garnered European exhibitions with these works. He was featured in the very first exhibition at the brand new Musée Maison du, du Culture in Le Havre during the summer of 1962. He showed at the Lambert Gallery that October not the one we know from today, but an art space founded on the Ile Saint-Louis by Polish emigres, Sofia and Kazimierz Romanowicz. His prize funds were intended to allow him to stay in the city, but also to travel, which he did, leaving Paris for London, Tokyo, and the US in December of 1962. And here is where the pictorial trail of documentation runs fairly cold. We know from the archival record that he received yet another bourse, this one from the US State Department, allowing him to stay in the US a few months more in 1963. We know that he visited Washington, apparently Washington DC <laughs> and New York, supposedly had an exhibition at a gallery in Washington, but was it Washington State or Washington DC? Uh, we can't verify this or document it in any way so far but this is a challenge to the listeners, go out and, and, and find the trail. In any case, after these poorly documented showings in the US in 1963, his presence in Paris was reestablished with a solo exhibition at the short-lived Galerie de Prosbourg, which is the subject of the 1964 review that appears in Le Monde and La Vie. Et La Vie. Sadekane stayed in Paris for three more years, leaving abruptly in 1967 for Pakistan with his ailing father. So Anglo-European publications often emphasize the abstract direction of Sadekane's work, this anguished, spiky, existentialist figuration drifting towards abstraction, typical of the illustrations that survive in Le Monde et la Vie. But it would be a mistake to imagine that this abstract quality only emerged in the metropole or that it stayed distinct from figuration at all times. As we know, the prize-winning canvas, The Last Supper, was painted in Pakistan be between his first brief visit to Paris in January 1961 and the second multi-year stay beginning in February a year later. He never stopped producing prolific calligraphy and poetry, later publishing a series of books documenting this consistent work that goes on throughout. While Sadeke knowingly staged paintings and drawings and calligraphy for specific audiences, that does not reduce to a formula of abstract painting for the West, figure and calligraphy for the rest. These modes are deployed in various places for different purposes and select recipients, filling niches in different art worlds in Europe, South Asia, and among diaspora elites. In fact, the very move of differentiating abstract and figurative art, which I've just indulged in, was a strongly Cold War antinomy. 
Delving into the criticism published in Paris around the time of Sadekane's visits and the Biennale itself reveals that the binary was actively produced by journalists in Paris on the right, on the left, and in the middle as a hot button issue. Notably, the contest was positioned as, explicit, as an explicitly Cold War affair by these French journalists covering the very Biennale that was exhibiting Sadekane. But I note the binary is primarily sustained by Westerners. Pakistani critics publishing in French contexts merely observed that Sadekane's work had transformed and could be expected to develop further as he engaged with Europe. Now that it was he, he was in Paris, one Pakistani wrote, it will be interesting to see what the influence of Europe will have for him, even as this writer asserts that, quote, the influence of his Muslim past and his native landscape is still paramount in his art. Threading a difficult needle, those Pakistani authors writing in French nonetheless insist that Sadikane, despite his Islamic affinities, does not thereby produce, quote, l'art oriental. And from the context, I take this to refer to Mughal miniatures in the South Asian subcontinent. Because he, he resists this oriental art because of his insistent, quote, need for space. In other words, the Last Supper is a large, very encompassing, immersive canvas. This complexly modernist frame negotiates Sadikane's links to an illustrative tradition of the Indian subcontinent, yet simultaneously confirms his resistance to illustration as it has been positioned that way in the historical Mughal miniature. Producing a signal of originality for the French, UK, and US markets, the Pakistani press release declares flatly, Sadikane wants to create. In contrast to this Pakistani navigation of the miniature tradition that must be exploded into space and into creativity in order to escape from pigeonholing as an oriental artist, Parisian critics situate every one of the artists in the biennial within a figurative abstract context, pitting Eastern Bloc painters such as Nemeth against classic modernists such as Leger, or more feverishly moaning about emerging unnamed Takists, whom I'm representing here with a work by the Romanian expat Alexandra Istrati. And let me give a disclaimer here. Neither of these paintings is probably in the Paris Biennial, right? These are just the kind of, um, the, the, the painter Nemeth is alluded to, Takists are alluded to. So these are placeholders for specific paintings that I'm having a hard time documenting in that Biennial. Jean Rollin, specifically, writing in the communist journal L'Humanité, glumly accepts that abstractionists and takists have held the dominant position in the biennial exhibition. Rollin complains about the solid boredom that results. Floor after floor, Rollin complains. We have the quote, monotony hanging on the walls devoted to the vulgarity of the stain and the frenzy of action painting. Now, what's interesting is that in, I've translated the French, but what's interesting is that the phrase action painting is given in English and is bolded in the original article. Roland is explicit on the Cold War context for his remarks, illustrating a work by the Hungarian Nemeth, but the illustration is so bad that I didn't, I didn't include it for you here, but it's similarly a single figure of a worker um, silhouetted in the context of that labor. Roland illustrates the work by Nemeth and notes that socialist countries free of market speculation enjoy a vast public and thereby pursue art with an intelligible character, producing a healthy context unfavorable to the development of anti-figuration. Okay, so abstraction is not a positive virtue, it is anti-figuration. Sadly for us, Roland doesn't mention Sadikane specifically, but he does praise Pakistan for, quote, resisting the contagion of the abstract, end quote. The Indian critic Pushpa is cited, describing the, quote, ardent experimenters in modern Indian art, who nonetheless conserve the source of their inspiration in India's traditions, 
e.g. the Mughal miniatures that are figurative um, in their nature. It's important for our Cold War context that this dyad between figurative and abstract is, in the communist journal L'Humanité, staged as the mirror opposite of the cultural message being pumped out by the US at the time. If the US was proposing that the West's unfettered capitalist freedom allowed the individualism of gesture painting and action painting to thrive, the European left positioned this very permission as a negative constraint, as I've mentioned, anti-figuration, which we can surmise connotes an active suppression of the laboring body of the proletariat. That Sadekane was spared this criticism is a bit perplexing. It's hard to see how Rollin could find the Last Supper or related studies like this one as resisting abstract contagion. Yet similarly to Rollin, the more politically moderate Parisian critic Claude Roger Marx also savages the biennial's possession by abstraction. Quote, constructivism, tachism, sculptural painting, scrap metal are rampant throughout this universe. And like myxomatosis, a South American virus lethal to European brush rabbits, ruthlessly ravages all the hutches of painters and sculptors. Well, I don't know if you can follow all that, but basically this contagion of abstraction is also discussed by a moderate critic who likens it to an invasion of a, a foreign virus from Latin America. I don't, there are Latin Americans in Paris, but there's just an, a vague association here uh, from, the, from the more moderate critic. Roger Marx hints, as Roland does, at an Orientalist inoculation against such diseases. The only artist who can resist the contagion, for example, the contagion from abstraction, come from certain countries in the East. For Roger Marx says, for whom, by tradition, painting and calligraphy are sisters. All right, so somehow calligraphy is part of the inoculation against abstraction. I mean, this is very interesting. Is it inoculatory because it might have semiotic significance? Well, that's not really happening in the calligraphic modernism of the moment, in any case. As if in response to this discourse of disease and contagion, Sadekane shows works in London the following year that seem a bit less impenetrable in their forms, if still, by my eyes, tending to be abstract. While always difficult to pinpoint exactly what works were in these exhibitions Sadekane staged during his travels, it's plausible that what I'm showing here might have been something like what the New York Herald Tribune critic Sheldon Williams praised from Sadekane's 1963 London exhibition. Quote, Sadekane is represented with one of his typical friezes. These have a metallic look, despite their being in the main, based on human figures and lines of trees. These black intaglios are set against murky blue and green cuprous backgrounds to create a brooding sense of the stirring forest. Seen in isolation, these canvases have power. Sadekane is thus successfully threading the divide between figuration and abstraction that's been produced in this criticism for these Western critics who describe suggestions of figures and trees that are never literalized. Yet none of this insightful and largely sympathetic early criticism makes any comparisons to Picasso. That comes, remember, a year later in the French language essay appearing in April 1964 in the Petanist rag, Le Monde et la Vie. It is here in pages referring to Sadekane's 1963 exhibition in Paris at the Galerie de Prébourg that the fateful comparison is made. The article appears in the spring 1964 edition with no byline. We don't know who wrote it. And that's unique in the issue. Every other article has a byline. And it's in the end pages of this deeply Catholic, right-wing, nationalist, Pétain-obsessed journal. As comparisons go, the author's text is both generous and mild, avoiding the violence of compression into the phrase Pakistani Picasso. 
Instead, the author writes, the constant research into invention plays with technical difficulties and the multiplicity of gifts is reminiscent of Picasso. The French language utilizes a delicate double negative for reminiscent. Ne pas sans rappeler Picasso. The name is invoked almost reluctantly. We find ourselves thinking of Sadekane's gifts and technical achievements, but realize that we cannot do so without recalling Picasso. Such a locution is almost apologetic, and it is also deliciously ambiguous. Is this problem Sadekane's, or is it ours? Sadly, this clue to predication's path is frustratingly anonymous. As I say, unusual within the journal as a whole, whose substantive essays all bear author names. Another gap concerns the intentions of hands-on editor Romain Roussel. Did he solicit the essay, or did he merely accept it as offered by an anon anonymous figure we can no longer identify in the Parisian art world of the time? The cover layout reveals the nationalist obsessions with Freemasonry. Is it pious or wicked? Um, and Pétain, how he saved the gold of the Bank of France and we held on to Guadeloupe and Martinique. But this only sharpens the Cold War puzzle. Why would the editors be interested in this Pakistani painter who is neither Catholic nor an explicit colonial subject of France? The nexus we need to summon, I propose, reveals the other side of the intertextual links that unite Roger Marx and Rolin in their reviews of the ideologically opposite communist take or the more moderate Figaro littéraire looking at the Paris biennial from those years earlier. Focusing on Roland's binary between copycat abstractionists and authentic figurative painters, we can see how Cold War politics, the bloc politics of the time, transmuted the national identity of an artist into a powerful signifier of soft politics in a divided globe. In this algorithm, which Figaro reviewer Roger Marx also deploys, Sadekane had fit with the other Eastern artists who had not succumbed to the abstract contagion. The anonymous author in La Mande de la Vie decides to split the difference. As skilled in the abstract as what is commonly called the figurative, he shows great dramatic sensitivity. Sadekane is both très moderne et très classique. Whether communist or pétainist, nationalist or internationalist, doxologies of French influence are upheld in a new Cold War world in which France must maintain pride of place within recently invented first, second, and third worlds. In this context, the ghost of Pétain within the reign of de Gaulle, then president from 1959 to 69, haunts conservative journalism as protector of a greater France, whose colonies heroically survived the trauma of a Second World War. The commonality thus is that both left and right hope to retain France's role as adjudicators of foreign artist status in a modernism that is epistemologically, securely French. Time for a handy chart. Whether left or right, figurative or abstract, modern or classical, or all of the above, Sadekane will be assuming his position as predicated, located as an aspiring outsider in the still strong site of arbitration for modern art, Paris. And the first predication of Sadekane in Le Monde de la Vie reinforces this, pointing out the salience of this artist as representative of an entirely new nation, Pakistan. This Pakistan, Sadikane's adopted country, but not the one of his birth, was of course a post-partition state, which by the mid-1960s had confirmed its political independence from India. Notably, Pakistan would further distinguish itself from India, which by 1971 at least had affiliated openly with the Soviet Union. Pakistan contrapuntally cozied up to the US and its former allies. While never a French colony, Pakistan could nonetheless be figured within a French nationalist project of celebrating others as other. As long as those others could still be placed within the compass of a patronage system, both financially and epistemically linked to France.
Buttressed by the French state's own campaign of support for foreign artists, extended as we've seen by funding from the US State Department, Sada Kane could be configured as a loyal subject of, you know, indebted to France in both stylistic and financial terms. Coming to Paris, or for that matter, Tokyo or London, via the Metropolitan Sanyasur of Paris, thereby celebrating France's beleaguered, beleaguered status as the center whose periphery must continue to be endorsed. And obviously in the background is something like Serge Guibault's argument about how, how New York stole uh, the idea of modern art from Serge's home, natal, natal state. So let me be clear, the comparison to Picasso is not unwarranted, right? Particularly when Sada Kane is in his 20s and still in Pakistan, he's very much looking um, at all the art magazines he can get his hands on, right? But when it appears in the Parisian context of Le Monde de la Vie, it nests itself within a system celebrating the world's newest nationals as subject, always already subject, to criteria controlled by the center that magnanimously welcomes them right, to that center. Within this context, the phrase is genuine as the anonymous author celebrates Sada Kane's new European palette and his dark existential mood. Quote, in each of his paintings, we find a deep sense of the organization of space with a rhythm of haunting forms halfway between dream and reality. Subtle colors are handled with great modesty, knowledgeable shading, and skillful modulation of bronzes and acid yellows. This evokes that London review from a year earlier. Sada Kane in this review is precocious, and the, and the reviewer surmises that we will continue to speak of this artist, not least because he has just been announced as the illustrator for a luxury edition of the Camus existential novel, L'Etranger, commissioned by a society of French bibliophiles. This, in fact, would be published in 1966 after Sada Kane had left Paris, never to return. The context I've conjured thus far is French, nationalist, conservative, or left. But what if this wide ranging review in La Monde et la Vie? itself turned out to have been written by a fellow Pakistani. Consider, for example, my speculation that the author was none other than Sayyid Waliullah. True, the text parallels the 1961 Pakistani publication on Sadi Kane by art critic Yunus Said. But in the end, that implies only that the Mondevi author had read Yunus's early essay commissioned by Karachi publishers. Waliyala would of course have, act, have had access to such a publication. A gifted and established writer, he was right there in Paris, already friends with Sadi Kane, having published an early review of Sadi Kane for Dawn, the flagship English language newspaper in Pakistan, as early as 1956. Bengali Muslim, modernist painter himself, novelist, Waliyala was serving the Pakistani embassy as press attache during this period, taking on the role of curator for the Pakistani contribution to the biennial. So obviously it's Waliullah who decides to put Sada Kane in that show. It was Waliullah who corresponded with those back home to give Sada Kane the news that he had won the Biennale's laureate. And Waliullah who drafted all the press materials on Sada Kane's contribution to the biennial. My speculation is further fueled by Waliullah's active role as an international art critic and his demonstrable literary gifts. He published the celebrated Bengali novel Lal Salu in 1948, and it was translated by his French wife and published in French in 1963, the year before the Le Monde de la Vie article, with an English translation achieved in 1967. Further evidence that the Mondevi author might be Waliullah is that the text has a fulsome and knowledgeable rehearsal of Sada Kane's career in Pakistan, knowledge that indicates information directly from the artist or someone close to him. The Waliullah family, who still live in Paris, confirmed the long friendship in the 60s between Waliullah and Sada Kane, 
probably dating back to the time when each of them worked at Radio Pakistan in Karachi in the late 40s and early 50s. Although the family has no material indicating that the 1964 review was drafted by Waliullah and no indication, no inclination to share my speculation on this, Waliullah's widow does recall Sadakane's frequent expression about himself in their company. Moi et Picasso, moi et Picasso, me and Picasso, me and Picasso. The point I want to make here is that the affiliation of Sadakane with Picasso was not just an, a European project. The new leaders of Pakistan had a big stake in celebrating an artist circulating abroad who had been lauded with international awards. The pressure to translate via comparatives between Pakistan and the world would be immense. And indeed, one can feel these pressures already in Waliullah's 1956 appraisal of Sadikane, written years before either of them was living in Paris. Written in Karachi in that first decade of Pakistan's independence, Waliullah was writing about Sadikane as the great hope of the nation. Self-taught, quote, unlabeled and unjudged, quote, in an artistically dormant culture like ours, an, an artistically dominant, a dormant country like ours, unquote. Sadikane could become, quote, one of our top ranking artists in future if he were given a modicum of support and left free from the overwhelming dictates of the surrounding society, end quote. Claiming such autonomy for Sadikane is itself a global modernist move. Yet Waliullah is unimpressed by Sadikane's French-oriented productions to date. One that he mentions by name has the Picassoid title Toilette, perhaps suggesting something like the later Three Graces that I'm showing you here. Waliullah disparages these Euro-savvy canvases as, quote, modern art with a bit of cheap psychology thrown in falling prey to the public demand, end quote. For Waliulli, it is Sadikane's pen and ink sketches that reveal the artist's artistic potentialities in the art he had admired and worshipped as a child. So do you see once again, the calligraphic Islamic is inserted as what Sadikane should syncretize in order to become authentic. Although we have no images to match Waliullah's text from this early Karachi period, there's one canvas in particular that we might imagine Sadikane producing in the months after he read Waliullah's encouraging but tough review. Considered by Sadikane himself to be a crucial crux for his breakthrough into international modernity, it is a canvas that scholars connect to the painter's oft-narrated 1957 retreat to a desert wilderness outside Karachi, where he worked out his calligraphic semi-abstraction far from global modernism's translational demands. But even as I've set up this, you know, exciting potential for an authentic Sadikane before predication, um, you know, that's, that's going to lead us astray. As Waliullah's 1956 review makes clear, the subcontinent had been engaging and producing global modernisms for some time. In this sense, comparative criticisms would have created an internal struggle for an artist such as Sadikane. Reading Waliullah's rejection of foreign models, his praise for tradition, and his seemingly impossible demand for an authentically modern, authentically Pakistani art, implicitly negotiates the predication to come. Because the moment of predication that asserts comparison is also the moment in which difference begins to erode that colonizing connection. Is a composition Kufic and hence readable as Arabic letters or suggestively figurative abstraction in a Western totemic orientalizing mode? We need to be both and. Audiences are situated differently in reading these circulating works. We need to interrogate how Sadikane's own polymorphousness plays out between the Parisian contexts we've already discussed and the supposedly native forces of Islamic calligraphy, national heroes, 
illustration, and some continental religions practice um, in, at play in Pakistan. So key to this argument is that specific landscape experience that Sadiqane himself cites as a breakthrough, instantiated in the canvas I've referred to, an extraordinary 1960 painting titled Cactus. So dated to 1960 and, and inscribed as such by Sadiqane, this was painted the year before Sadiqane made his first trip to Paris. Cacti loom large in the narratives about the retreat Sadiqane took in 1957 outside Karachi, where massive and ancient organ pipe varieties thrive on the arid Balochistan coast. These towering, threatening plants constituted for Sadiqane the source of a revelation. Their upreaching thorned branches assuming the forms for him of Kufic calligraphy. Even for an art historian educated in Euro-American modernism who has no capacity to read Arabic, Cactus sweeps away notions of influence or predication in favor of anticipation or prediction. It seems to anticipate the forms of chilida or the sinuous brushstrokes of soulage. Thus, the modernity of Sadiqane's breakthrough painting manages to communicate even to one unable to parse its complex relations to semiosis. Those familiar with Urdu or Arabic scripts will see much more. As I come toward the conclusion of this talk, I celebrate this vision of a fully Pakistani yet syncretic and modernist Sadiqane. The artist of cactus cannot easily be compared to Europe's painters across the figurative abstract divide of the mid 60s, yet it functions robustly within the more global modernisms to come. Cactus performs the tension in Sadiqane's oeuvre that operates between the large scale oils on canvas, which is, remember, a Euro American scale and medium, whether abstract or figurative, landscape or portraiture and the often textual, poetic, and calligraphic pra practices that grounded his reputation in Islamic South Asia. This tension is extremely rich, evinced in Sadiqane's prolific production of printed materials. For example, compare his drawn self-portrait on the left and one of the commissioned illustrations for the aforementioned luxury edition of L'Etranger completed in Paris and copyrighted in 1966, but seemingly printed only after Sadiqane returned to Karachi. Formal comparison becomes an unwitting part of predication. The invidious comparisons with Picasso and these etchings, as you see on the left, are unavoidable, as the spidery figures of the illustration on the right evoke Picasso's line drawings as well as the unavowed but contemporaneous spindly existentialism of Alberto Giacometti. However, the self-portrait drawings also lead us somewhere else. Being told I can interpret the artist's depicted fingers as spelling Allah, I gain a different insight, which is only possible for me via Iftikhar Dadi's readings pushed further with the help of Sarah Rifke, who would extend this reading into a possible kind of Kufic analogy to those fingers. Readings that are nonetheless rejected by historian of Islamic architecture, Kishvar Rizvi. Just as the artist is enabled by colleagues and influencers, so is the art historian. And if we are to puncture the strictures of national boundaries and languages to engage the messy ways that art makes meaning in the Cold War, we need to do this collaborative work. Sadiqane courted complexity already in his own lifetime and was indeed conscious of the example of Picasso that Dadi tames by calling Sadiqane's modernism pulverized and post-Cubist. As we learned from the memories of Waliullah's family from the 1960s, Sadiqane was somewhat obsessed with the example of the world's most powerful communist pacifist artist in the Cold War. The artist was still obsessed in the year before he died, 1986, as Sadiqane made this drawing of himself before Picasso, which summons the competing artist as a young immigrant with that penetrating Catalan stare from Yo Picasso, 
Iftikhar Dadi captures the ambition here, writing, who would be more appropriate to assume the role of the dialogic partner than the master of modernism, Picasso himself? The naturalized Frenchman was indeed the man to beat. On the other side of the Atlantic, the archaic mythmakers of the New York School were equally drawn to the bestial imaginary of the still surrealist Picasso. There's no explicit Cold War significance in this affinity, but there is the effort to resist predication on the part of these provincial artists in New York, no less than Karachi, through sheer ambition to surpass the top dog. So predication was inevitable for the young Sadikane coming to Paris to take up his bourse from the French state as part of that nation's Biennale de la Jeunesse, which was itself a Cold War bid for France to remain the center of contemporary modern art. Like the 1867 World's Fair, whose plan I'm showing you here, the orders of such world picture and gambits would always be organized via divisions by the powers, as we're seeing here at the bottom of the plan. Namely, the nation states that continued to be celebrated in foreign pavilions during the Biennale de la Jeunesse. Sadekane's award one of six explicitly set aside for foreign artists would allow the reminiscence of Picasso to be floated as a signifier interpolating this South Asian modernist navigating calligraphy, figuration, and abstraction into the European fold. But I want to be clear, it would only be the later codification of Sadikane in Pakistan and throughout his diasporal South Asian communities in the US that the congealed phrase, the Pakistani Picasso would finally emerge. It was this phrase that featured as the subject header of an email that initially attracted my attention to this artist when this publication was produced and being promoted by the avid Sadikane Foundation in the US, which had been founded a few decades ago by, by a nephew of Sadikane's in San Diego, California. The link to Picasso is repeated not once, but twice on the cover of this book. The Cold War linkage to Picasso having become a marketing tool for a particularly westernized Sadikane. But if the wise men from the East can cement this Islamic painter into a still broadly Christological universalism, we still need to understand how that coexists with Pakistani allegiances, such as the painter's friendship with Aziz Ahmad, to whom the painting wise men is floridly inscribed. Apparently the inscription at the upper left of this Byzantinizing modernist painting is a personal one by which the artist gives or addresses the painting to Ahmad, who is the poet progressive scholar of Islamic history an extraordinary diplomat of his age. Sadikane's inscription also conveys to Ahmad the power to do with the painting what he will. Soon after Sadikane's painting was so dedicated, Ahmad himself would publish the English edition of his Islamic modernism with Oxford University Press in London in 1967, going on to serve as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States and then foreign secretary under President Ayub Khan. The painting, it seems, was left behind and seems to be in the possession of Sadikane's eponymous foundation. So Cactus, then, is a one-off as far as we know. I've privileged this 1960 canvas as a pre-predicated but nonetheless syncretic work of what we could agree to call Pakistani modernism. Recall that Cactus was painted after that revelatory desert retreat. It was there that Sadikane, from a family long associated with Quranic calligraphy, saw the source of sacred Kufic calligraphy in the twisted but somehow organized geometry of an organ pipe cactus. Without being able to read any Kufic in the madly tangled branches, I can nonetheless make out actual calligraphy at the bottom right of the canvas in which the letters mingle with energetic drips and organized brushstrokes to spell Sadikane's name and give the date in Urdu, forming an elegant, if implied, cartouche. 
But one of the Western art historical conceits that Sadegain refuses with this painting is the notion of a progressive series of cumulative styles. I'd be interested in whether this distinguished audience can come up with a Cold War gloss for this polymorphous mid-century modernism of Sadekain Nachvi, cutting across figuration and abstraction, word and image, text and figuration. Sadekain's calligraphic modernism could embrace both the Shikasta script of an original poetic rubaiyat, an emulation of Khalil Gibran, himself a Cold War celebrity, and the non-linguistic orientalizing canvases so often dubbed arabesques. Of course, we need to be a little suspicious of these extremely handsome canvases directed at non-Arabic reading Westerners and elite diasporic collectors. Since, as the comic Urdu poet Anwar Maksud recently noted, quote, Sadakain had made many more paintings after his death than when he was alive. Claimed to be from a lost exhibition in Paris in 1966-67, the canvases now surfacing in European auction houses and New York galleries cannot really be secured in a provenance like that of the contemporaneous published poems and manuscript, such as the bottom right book, which prints these entries from Sadi Kane's biennial birth trip to London in 1963. I acknowledge that these Arabesque canvases addressed to the illiterate who will never read Arabic calligraphy are tailor-made for me. Should I thereby redouble my suspicion or could both kinds of production fit Iftikhar Dadi's description of Sadikain as the author of a translational modernist Muslim aesthetics during the era of nationalism or Dadi's celebration of calligraphic modernism more generally? Mind you, Dadi cautiously avoids the canvases, and yet I find them irresistible challenges for our Cold War optic. To return to the broader inquiry I opened with about calligraphic modernism in the Cold War, we would be wise to track, as Eugenia Bogdanovich, uh, Bogdanova Kumar does in a recent Tate research publication, the to and fro of nationalist claims that ascribed meanings, whether semiotic or political, to such calligraphic abstractions. Emerging among artists with very different motivations, calligraphic modernisms are nonetheless interpreted within classically Cold War framings. Again, it is important to remember the early Cold War moment of the 50s, when it was all important to make common cause with artists across borders, to establish a cosmopolitan inter international alliance, and to recover from toxic nationalisms and fascisms on all sides. This should be strongly contrasted with the heights of the Cold War, evident in more nationalist positionings from the later 1950s through the 1970s. Whether the Pax Americana celebrated by Greenberg as he revised his writing on Klein, or the Islamicization hinted by Sadikane in the context of a Pakistani dictatorship, there is a reassertion of nationalist, ethnic, even religious bona fides in the later Cold War period that is absent in the earlier phase. So if Sadikane's early Pakistani works would be critiqued by Waliullah in 1956 for their cheap psychology and European affectations, Cactus set the terms of a calligraphic modernism that would ultimately feed into Sadekain's more consciously Paris-destined works. Yet still, Sadekain cannot escape from the sobriquet Pakistani Picasso, now promulgated by diaspora South Asians and auction houses in an Anglophone context that follows the market and replicates the colonial predicated internationalisms of our global condition. Ultimately, there's no tidy way to put Sadekain securely in a box labeled East or West, aligned or non-aligned. In a late self-portrait as a Sufi fakir, Sadekain is protesting acts of censorship by the Islamic sectors of mid-70s Pakistan. But the Edenic note of his depicted setting, an apple tree, really wants to have it all. Sadekain 
is an original Adam, a martyred Christ, and a Gandharan Buddha. Resolutely syncretic, but also polymorphous and perverse, Sadekane's art conjures a transnational and translational figure willing to put up with predicated internationalism if it secures him a place in the global conversation, occupying an imagined and asserted universalism, which is where he wants to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm still um, digesting that brilliant uh, analysis, that very far reaching uh, historiography, that proposition for a new methodology or for a methodology of and or, or both and, excuse me, <laughs> not and or, both and. Um, that was really uh, tour de force. Um, and we will go straight to the discussion since we are now almost at 7.30. Uh, and to do so, I, I would like to invite uh, Uta Mehta Bauer to join us. Uta Mehta Bauer is founding director of the NTU CCA Singapore and professor School of Art, Design and Media, NTU Singapore where she co-chairs the MA in Museum Studies and Curatorial Practice. In 2015, she co-curated with Paul C. Ha, the US Pavilion for the 56th Venice Biennale, featuring eminent artist Joan Jonas, and was appointed co-curator of the 17th Istanbul Biennial and curator of the National Pavilion of Singapore, 59th Venice Art uh, Biennial which will feature Shubigi Rao, both in 2022. Her recent research focuses are on spaces of the curatorial in Southeast Asia, as well as on the interrelation of climate change and cultural loss. I welcome Uta Mehta Bauer also to our discussion. And of course, everybody who is listening and who would like to take part is welcome to pose questions in the Q&A or in the chat. So maybe just to kind of start us off, um, I thought it's fascinating, um, you know, that the Biennale de Paris, which is actually founded in 1959 by André Malraux, right, is, uh, is part of this uh, civil servant, civil servant class of, uh, of um, institutional modernism, right, with André Malraux, kind of spearheading it in 1951, uh, 1959, and of course, uh, uh, the, uh, 1961 being the second case, uh, second uh, edition. But I also want to bring another figure into it, who is um, Pierre Estany, who is also a civil servant, who is also, also becomes the kind of voice, actually, of the Nouveau Realiste, right? And so, we have this other channel that is also uh, moving between abstraction and figuration, also through the mediation of another bureaucrat turned curator slash uh, critic. And I think that's really fascinating to just, um, you know, add that to our, to our space of discussion, that we also have the Nouveau Realiste uh, circulating in this space. And we have other uh, bureaucrats who are uh, making these uh, decisions who, about who will enter the space of modernism, especially for the youth, right? Under 90, uh, they had to be under 35 years old in order to be in the Biennale de Paris. So it's also this youth culture, of course, that is being yeah. produced. And I want to I wanna reassert the importance of the market throughout, because Rastani is writing the Tuscan uh, collector Panza mm. and specifically saying, don't buy another Rothko. I mean, forget about it. Buy the Nouveau Realist, they're the hip thing, right? So he's actually in the, in the sales room. I don't know if he gets a cut, but he's definitely in a marketing mood. So this, this cannot, you know, we can't be too pure about what's going on here. There's actual capital. Um, and, and that's very mysterious with Sadekane because he 
again, in perversity and um, a certain kind of posture that needs to be understood, he refuses to sell things, he gives them away. Mm -hmm. So he has a strange patronage structure where you know, you put him up in your garage and he paints the wall crazily overnight, you know, All right? So there's a, the, so that Ama dedicated painting, you know, is typical. It would be dedicated and just given to him. Who pays for the materials, right? There's a mysterious um, cultural capital generated by Sadekane that needs to be distinguished from something like the Nouveau Realists or, you know, Pollock and Rothko who are entering stable gallery systems and being paid by gallerists to support themselves while they generate work for the market, right? So that's something, yeah, we might want to just throw in there. Yes, and but not to move away from your argument, of course, which is the, that there is this whole field of signifiers around style um, yeah. that, uh, that uh, implicate both the right and the left in this kind of contested space for hegemony uh, and that it's around figuration and abstraction uh, where he comes in, Sadakane comes in as this other, as this cipher that is, uh, that circulates between them both, uh, which I think is, is he, would you say that he is an exceptional case in this, in, in this situation or are there others like him? Oh man, I mean, which aspect could be exceptional? He's clearly, a pretty unique character. Mm -hmm. But I, I would turn to the audience and see if others can speak to his exceptionalism, you know? Um, I mean, these postures of the fakir, these postures of the, you know, the crazy uncle whom everybody adores, but nobody can put up with for more than two weeks. You know what I mean? It's like, he's, he's, a, he's performing and inhabiting a character and I'm not con I'm not culturally competent to situate that it probably according to Dadi and others that I've read it probably has more to do with the inspired poet in um, Urdu right and you know the Dastangoy who will tell a story for six hours right it probably has more to do with a literary tradition that is somehow transposed and yeah, that, that might be common across Cold War. You know, you, you might find a um, artist modeling themselves on Camus or Sartre, right, in certain circuits. So that may not be unique. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'm capable of saying mm -hmm. what okay. is unique here. But I'd love to take Uta's take on this because I, I was very conscious of sort of expanding the ambit to look at Eastern you know, Far Eastern, right? I mean, Yoshihara, you know, Bokubi. I mean, I think it's a, it, I think it's a moment where Iftikhar Dadi's really fruitful phrase of calligraphic modernism could be looked at in a, in a, in a very broad context. So that, that, that got me excited just, just lobbing that in there, but I don't know if we want to do anything with it. <laughs> No, I think it's thanks so much, Kerry, for for this really also inquisitive talk. Really looking into um, stories that are not written, histories that are not written, and that are left out. And I think that is something very peculiar, particular. If you look up um, um, also institutional roles. I mean, you you and Iftikhar are also art historians and looking into also an individual practice of an artist and how does that unfold. Uh, being between cultures, but being also um, people of their time, intellectuals of their time and reflecting their time. What I think is very interesting, what you also brought in in parts is um, the role of the institutions, the role of the curatorial, the curatorial ambition in the Cold War. Um, and I think it's very interesting because you're looking East uh, while, for example, one of my PhD students, Kathleen Dietzig, they're looking West. So they're looking the role of um, MoMA, I mean, which you know, sure, well. sure. I mean, um, Bateson and, and others like um, to conquer kind of like Southeast Asia as um, I would say as a geopolitical kind of like strategic step. And this is where it's very interesting to link what you say also to Naeem's um, uh, film and, and uh, his, his installation and the depicting as an artist of this period through 
a filmic kind of representation and uh, also living between the cultures and like his father living between cultures and histories. And I think it's um, such a complex time. And to me, it's very peculiar, like this notion who wants to own politics through culture or culture through politics in the Cold War. And I think it's, for me, it's a very interesting moment because culture played a much more important role, I would say, than today. Today, to me, culture is strongly embedded in a market, while then culture was very strongly embedded in a political ambition and vision. It, it was inseparable in a way. As I say, Mairo was also Minister of Culture. He was in Cambodia before. And so I think this is, to me, this very interesting kind of link. Um, that culture was seen, and you mentioned documenta, culture was seen as um, a very strategic, um, important force that had power. You know? Yeah, and I mean, we could be nostalgic for that. I think we, we, we should guard and be aware of our nostalgia for that because um, people like us would have had influence. <laughs> you know what I mean? We need to, we need to, be a little bit skeptical so that we check our nostalgia for this moment uh, that you're that you're recalling this moment of power where culture I had i'm not necessarily uh, nostalgic i was just done for example in name uh, mamian's film like uh, to see Ratcharatnam um introducing uh, also the role of culture and like i mean we had a ministry of culture then in singapore which in that way it was so important uh, for this young republic so you know so this is i'm not nostalgic i think i'm stunned in a way yeah you yeah. know about the role of, of culture that it was seen as um a natural part like any other ministry or like it, it was um part of a strategy while today it's, it's it's not so much from seen from a nostalgic moment is much more um with a um, retrospective curiosity you know like we get reminded that there was yeah. a different role you could also yeah. say role culture then was instrumentalized and maybe today is more free so you know one can see it from different yeah perspectives. yeah i think those are great observations and i'm always i'm always encouraging students to look at the org chart you know the organizational chart so in france the ministry I could be wrong, but I remember certainly today, most of the funding for cultural exchange coming out of France is funneled through the State Department. It's explicitly diplomatic and political. It's not intended to be ornamental in any way. It's it's a very frank, whereas in the US context, there's you know constant revelations. Oh my God, the the CIA was secretly funding this, right? So in the US, it's staged as a revelation that it's political and staged as part of soft diplomatic, you know, you know, Cold War politics or politics today. Whereas in France, it's like, well, of course, what, what do you think? This is a State Department funding stream. You know, so I think the org charts can also be, be interesting in that way. Um, you know, most people, for example, Uta, you've lived this. Most people don't realize that the U.S. pavilion in Venice Biennale is like privately funded. Owned. Right? That's so weird, right? Privately owned. And the French, you know, of course it's funded by the State Department. What, what are you thinking? Right? So, so these org charts, um, they're important for us to not be monolithic because they're quite weirdly specific. So, so the reason that, one of the reasons that Pac uh, that um, Sadi Kane first comes to Paris in 61 is that he has won the national exhibition that Pakistan has newly begun to create a national discourse. I mean, none of these artists are Pakistani because the country hasn't existed until, you know, until that moment, right? So it's just a fascinating problematic. They, they have a national exhibition that Sadi Kane wins and then he's picked up by the internationalists to come to Paris as kind of like, oh, now that your country has designated you as the best, we want you to have this benefit of coming to Paris, right? So the national and the international are constantly reinforcing each other and constantly in dialogue. 
And it's interesting that uh, in these first biennales, there was really a kind of the embassies, right? As you mentioned. Oh, yeah. Kind of there was an official role for the embassies to nominate these artists, right? To be the, the, the middle. To be the, the curators. Middle, yeah. Right. And I'm just thinking of that because the same problematic brings us to the Magicien de la Terre of 1989. Mm -hmm. So I'm fast forwarding to basically the future of this discussion where you also have Jean Hubert Martin defending himself for the way in which he chose his artists, right? Who he sent to the field to be his, uh, you know, his proxies. But you also have in 1989, the other story, right? Um, in England, right? The other story by Rashida Rahim alongside um, alongside a magicien de la terre dealing with the same kind of problematic of modernism in which you can only be an artist if you're modern and you can only be modern if you follow these uh, these constraints of what we define as modern which is a certain stylistic uh, field so I'm fascinated by your choice of this artist who is really like a third term, so to speak, and that he brings both and that he cannot be reduced to either one of these um, uh, uh, binary positions, but that that same problematic is, you know, reemerges in 89 precisely at the so called, let's say, end of a certain historiography. But I think you know, it, you, it's also important if you mentioned, um, and I wanted actually to come to Rashid Arin, who is, of course, um, also an artist from Pakistan, uh, London based, and who came a bit later to the map and one of the founders of Sir Text. And who really, I mean, there was a debate uh, not that long ago to be nostalgic uh, between MoMA again and uh, some of the artists in, in uh, Simam, which is the conference. Um, of um, International Museums of Modern Art. And there was a discussion questions from the audience in the 1998 um, edition of the Simam annual meeting in Barcelona. And um, some people in the audience, uh, actually in that case, um, Eric Camara from the Senegal has been asking the panel, uh, why is there not more um, modern art from Latin America, from Africa, from, from other parts of the world at MoMA or like writing this narrative. And then the answer was, um, you're welcome to visit our museum, but not everybody can be exhibited. And that was in 1998. I think none of the museums like MoMA or Tate or so would dare to say that today. So I think um, we understand in the meantime that um, certain movements are not owned by a certain place. They are like, as Roger Burgo, mentioned it in his documenta, documenta 12, the migration of form, you know, like, I mean, Kubism, of course, is already a migration of form and adapted and adjusted. Or if you take Wilfredo Lam, for example, who was also part of the circle around Picasso and um, who also only later, I think, was recognized as an Afro-Cuban artist uh, for his contribution to a uh, Kubism. Afro-Cubism, so but not allowed to be Chinese. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, these predications, more more these predications, yeah, these predications are something I want us to pay attention to. Yeah, no, you know, no, they're it's just totally so, true, they're so fabulous. They're so fabulous. Um, we can't see the Chinese in Wilfred Olam. Yeah, we just no, can't. Is, we can't. We can't make it out. Thing. We can't make it out. Um, but I love all the things you're saying, Uta, and I want to just remind us of the postmodern which had everything to do with that discourse. So I happen to have the privilege of, of being a, a fly on the wall as a lowly employee at MoMA. Mm -hmm. And I still have the Xerox of the conversation between the museum director and the chief curator at that time, which was a secret debate guiding, you know, development efforts in the future. Basically, should the modern just like close around the modern idea? Like, of course, we're not getting African work because they're not modern in 1930. Like, whatever African works are, they're not modern, right? So this kind of stylistic corpus that maybe we now have to close in 1981, we have to just seal it off and say that was wonderful and we're going to be that museum. Or director's position, oh, no, we are the moving torpedo 
of the modern, right? We, we need to capture work as it emerges because that's our mission. The one closing off is like the end of funding because your, your, board, of, your board of trustees is not supposed to keep collecting art, right? The, obviously they want the constant omnivorous postmodern position because their trustees are going to keep collecting art, right? So, um, so that is also in question here, the Cold War kind of the Cold War presumption of a single style that someone like Restiny was contesting. Restiny was not saying, hey, let's have pluralism. Why don't you look at some nouveau realism? No, Restiny was saying, nouveau realism is the thing. Give up all your other allegiances. This is the thing. So the torpedo, the mainstream, you know, the single style that everybody should be pro or con, right? Um, that was beginning to fracture, certainly in the 70s in the US. And, um, and the fascination with a figure like Sada Kane is that he, he never had a single style, mm. right? I mean, and, and so that's part of the tension I wanted to surface that our history is like, what do we do with this guy? Because we cannot tame his evolution. We can't say, well, this was his blue period. No, oh, this is his figurative period. No, I mean, we, we, we cannot get him into our desired art historical sequencing of a single style at a time or whatever, right? So he's almost like pre-postmodern, <laughs> you know? <laughs> In the way Richter would say, I'm going to paint photorealist candles and I'm going to make completely abstract works, deal with it, right? And it was a very conscious postmodern procedure. So, yeah, Sadekane is just doing it and he doesn't really, you know, he, he doesn't see a problem with that. And that is a signal of our problem, mm. you know, as art history. I mean, I think the other important part is uh, that of borders, not just that of institutions, but that of countries and artists usually uh, did not, as you say, they didn't respect like borders of being part of this or that, but they also don't uh, accept geopolitical borders. I mean, and, and I think this is why I think it's so hard sometimes for institutions who get certain mandates that are more bureaucratic, as you say, no, it, um, to deal with certain artworks because artists are not necessarily following these categories the opposite, they're opposing those categories. And um, I think that is to me very interesting that they often be deliberately in another country and later they get reclaimed through the museums or so like, because they have to represent something in the history or like correct something in that history. And I think um, the strategy, Caroline, what you bring up, like also resisting to be pigeonholed by your style or this, like, which is kind of a violation uh, to a certain degree because you cannot be categorized. I think that's very interesting to look this up also because, again, it can be deliberate uh, on the one side for choice of doing something else or like deliberate resisting to being categorized or put in a drawer. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very... Um... I love the epistemic tricks of someone like Finbar, Barry Flood, right? Who's saying, let's look at Picassisme as an Islamic trope. I mean, obviously it's reductive, but you know, to 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 refuse the idea that Picasso somehow progresses the primitive or progresses you know, the abstract oriental and to, and to say instead, Picasso is an influence machine. He, you know, he would absorb and transmute what we, we should understand at root as an Islamic relation to abstraction or something like that. I mean, in other words, I love these art historical moves where you, where you just really try and redirect um, the, the westernized narrative. It just, it just feels like fresh air in the brain, you know? So I think, I, think that's, I think that's an interesting trick for us to try on in these Cold War narratives, you know? So it's very hard for me with my limitations to say, oh, uh, let me try and understand Pakistani modernism from the inside. Um, that's why I'm so dependent on these di diplomats, these translator figures like Waliula. I think he's super interesting, right? And I'm hoping Naeem will, you know, take him on and 